printing for the past year and a half. So this is my uh, Twitter and my email. It doesn't work. You have to wait a bit. Um, and I'm not Greek, I'm Polish. It's just the first two letters of my name. I get a lot of Greek emails, though, because of that. <laughs> and uh, I have to learn that, I guess. <laughs> OK, so I will start with a short introduction to 3D printing. And I will give you some short history. And um, I'll break down the types of different machines that we can use. Because I think it's very important that we know uh, what machine are we doing while we're working uh, on, like what kind of uh, machine are we going to print our prints on, our designs, because there are some differences. Okay, so uh, what is 3D printing? 3D printing, or you could call it an additive manufacturing method, uh, is, um, is a method of manufacturing layer by layer. Uh, so. I created a, sh a small render here, which shows you roughly what happens when you 3D print on an FDM printer. So if you print uh, in plastic, like these kind of objects here. Um, so what happens is uh, you start at the first layer. It prints, prints a shell around the whole object. That's where it looks pretty. And inside, it's a mesh, just not, so you don't waste too much material. Kind of a support mesh. OK? And this, this object here on the left can be 3D printed as well. But uh, I just gave it an, as, as an example. It's uh, more complex, and uh, there are some constraints I'll talk about later. OK? So just a quick history. So 3D printing is not new at all. It's, uh, it's been uh, first patented in uh, 1984 with a stereolithography printer that uses liquid. That's where the STL came from as well. The format name is from, from the steel lithography uh, printers, uh, the method. So the applications, there's a wide array of applications, pretty much in every kind of, every, in every industry that uses a bit of design, uses any kind of devices, there is always going to be some, someone that used 3D printing to create something. From obviously from prototyping to creating a final, final products, I've seen people doing uh, using uh, 3D prints in medicine as implants. Yes, I have a question. Or <laughs> so, <laughs> there is uh, there is a, there are a lot of uses which I will talk about later. And uh, if you if you if you want to add something, actually actually if you want to add something to what I'm talking about, you can you can uh, go ahead. I, I want to I want it to be an open session because. Uh, I had a half an hour slot, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to talk maybe for 40 minutes and try to be a bit slower. So 3D printing uh, versus versatile manufacturing, it's, um, it's, it's uh, the same thing in the end, but the, the two terms are used uh, in different areas. So 3D printing is used by hobbyists and plastic stuff that you just print for fun, while additive manufacturing is um, more used into a, for the professional kind of apply applications like uh, in, in motor industry in the, and medicine. They, do, they call it additive manufacturing because it sounds different. OK, so just a quick, um, because everyone is talking about 3D printing, everyone thinks it's really cool, and that you know, oh, you can print anything, which is not exactly true. And we are currently, consumer 3D printing is at the at the peak on the, of the hype cycle. So people, everyone is excited, but we are going to see some decline, and people will wake up and realize what can be done, what cannot. So try to uh, point out some, some things. We have to keep in mind, if we want to design something to be 3D printable, we will have to take into account some constraints and some physical con constraints that, that will make us it will, will cause us problems, and uh, you have to be really patient with 3D printing, really patient. So just quickly, um, some pros and cons. So like I've said before, the technology is improving, and it's, be, it's beginning to be used in so many industries around us everywhere. Um, one of the cool things about 3D printing is that wastes less energy for small-scale manufacturing. We can uh, quickly prototype create uh, cheaper products, 
which are more economical as well. You don't create useless molds for that every time. You just print a, uh, print a design, and you can have five iterations in one day. Um, so it's uh, it's faster than traditional manufacturing because for just for the prototyping because you don't have to create the molds, uh, which would take months, and the process is just crazy. Uh, it obviously gives you freedom of creation. It's very customizable for custom products. So anything that is on this table, I don't think there's a second item in on the, actually, yeah, maybe uh, except the hand because that's from Thingiverse. But uh, all of the objects are designs that are made by me except the hand and there is not, not a second one on Earth that's exactly the same. Um, so, and the most importantly, the community is really great. Uh, oh yeah, it's working. Now it's working. Okay. Uh, so, so the community is really great. The people around 3D printing are really very passionate and very enthusiastic about the whole technology, and they are they range from very techy people and and uh, very. Uh, Uh, no? Oh yeah. Okay. I have I have static hands. I'm not touching the button. I just I just I just I just turned uh, I just turned it off and on because it yeah yeah it's low battery so so I don't have static hands. Uh, okay. And the minuses the the B size of three printing is the speed and resolution uh, for for a high. Re high amount of production if you want to produce, let's say, phone cases, you know, it's going to take you like an hour or something to print you one case at high resolutions. You cannot sell that, you cannot really... Yeah, I can, oh, no. <laughs> I have to get back to it, I guess. So, so I, like I said before, you cannot uh, print anything. There's a limitations in uh, physical limitations and also in materials. You are limited by, plastic, by, by stuff that melts, basically, and liquids that solidify. So you cannot print in wood, uh, although there are some materials that are partially wood, but it's... Mm, it's not possible yet, unless we manage to develop wood that melts, but maybe not. <laughs> and labor is expensive, uh, and by that I mean that education, to educate people how to design, create, uh, actually, like not like go on Thingiverse and just I'll put my name in that phone case, but actually design something from scratch, so we know that it takes a, lot of, a long time especially if you don't know anything about 3D design and you have to learn from scratch to use Blender, um, then, then that takes time. And uh, also to operate printers, you have to learn how to do that. So it's not quite there yet. In the I think it's. Oh, I think it comes back on a not like I, I'm using the last. Okay, 
We are back. Uh, so labor is expensive, education not, is not for everyone, not, uh, not everyone can learn how to design or to 3D print, it requires a lot of patience and a lot of time and iterations just to get something to be printed properly and you have to go through the whole process of, because you won't know if it prints until you actually start printing and then you learn on your mistakes, so it's, uh, this is the problem yet, the printers are not clever yet about that. So we need to be clever. Uh, let's go back. Uh, yes. Yeah, so illegal implications. Just uh, uh, that basically means that what happens if you print a car and someone someone drives your 3D printed car and it crashes? Who is who is responsible for that? Then is it him because he printed that car, or you because you designed it this way, or who who is responsible for for those those things? But that's not clear. Okay, we could shortly get to uh, actual interesting stuff um, in Blender, but quickly I'll just mention, so FDM printers are the most popular. We have Ultimaker, that's the Dutch uh, super popular printer in Europe, and that prints in plastic and to different, well, different types of plastic, nylon, and so on, and different composites, but it extrudes uh, on a platform, basically it's just the simplest one and that's what people have in homes and SLA so that's the, the first patents and uh, this one is actually not open source uh, machine same as this one isn't either but I just showing them as, a, as an example so SLA uses a uh, liquid to and uh, UV laser or different light techniques to solidify the resin so you have very high resolutions with these ones same with SLS and uh, uh, SLM printers which use powder, very fine powder and lasers as well. So basically the only the only resolution the only constraints you have in resolution is the layer I mean the, the size of the laser which is like really tiny and the uh, powder uh, which you use. The powder is very fine. So they they have really high resolutions. And that will actually um, influence our design process because if you design for depending on which printer do you use it design for, you will have to keep in mind that uh, certain things are possible to be done to, when you're printing on SLS machine, but you won't be able to print this on a FDM machine because these parts are too thin. You maybe you would be able to, to print it, but it wouldn't be, pr wouldn't be pretty and you wouldn't be able to finish it so well with very thin parts. Not yet, because uh, the printers are not so precise. The, the, it's basically on extruder uh, thickness is not that thin yet. Okay, so <clears throat> open source is at the heart of 3D printing. The first FDM printers that were developed were open source projects and uh, very much people used Blender with that and a lot of software is uh, open source and the whole hardware. Uh, so the recent boom, like we hear all, all about those different printers coming out, they basically stems from Repra project. Um, so some of the open source uh, 3D printers, the po most popular ones are print, uh, Printerbot, which is the one I have, uh, Ultimaker, Loosebot, Taz, they're very, there's, there's a whole legion of them coming out and all the time is you can't keep up, okay? so open source software used for 3D printing. Uh, so this is the most popular trio. So obviously Blender, everyone knows, everyone knows Blender. Then you use uh, Slicer and then uh, Repetier Host. These, are, these ones work very, very well all together. Gives you, uh, it gives you, a lot of, um, uh, gives you a lot of control over the process, the, this trio. And um, it's very important that uh, when you design, you actually know what slicer you're going to use because uh, some have different, they generate supports differently and uh, it's important that you know. Okay, learning curve, like I said, it requires a lot of patience. This is only for the first three months. I, I had my printer for the first three months and that's, that's only, only a tiny bit. Uh, lots of those prints are actually uh, Failed, failed prints because I didn't design them properly or because uh, I didn't uh, fix, this, fix the prints if, for when I downloaded them from Thingiverse. So it's important to know when you're designing for 3D printing 
uh, when you use Blender or any other software, but we use Blender. Uh, when you design and prepare a 3D scan, so first of all, like I said, you need to know how, what kind of machine are you going to use, uh, and that not everything can be printed, so in the scale, for example. Uh, so, uh, okay, so after you design something in Blender, uh, use use slicer to generate uh, G code, which is information for the for the actual machine, how to move the extruder around and how to uh, what what to re what to extrude, when to extrude, when to slow down, and and so on. And Repetier is just used to initialize and as an interface between the user and the printer. Okay, we'll get shortly. We'll get into Blender design workflow tips. Okay, so uh, manifold watertight mesh, no holes. That means a manifold mesh is a mesh I don't know if everyone knows, but I will just show you quickly. Um, so if we have, uh, where is it? Not on the internet. Nope. <laughs> Not sure. Okay, I have some Blender files open. Okay, so I will just do, so this is the classic Suzanne model. And this one is actually non-manifold, I think. Yeah, this one is non-manifold. So you can use the shortcut, Control shield oh no, I need a third hand. Control shift alt m which will select the non-manifold edges. So the model, perfectly, we want the model to be manifold, as in it can hold water, it can be a solid, one solid piece. And I will show you in a second. Um, what's the difference? So this is the non-manifold, non Suzanne. And if you wanted to 3D print it, probably with the printer, uh, with the new slicers, it will slice perfectly fine. But we want to be professional, so we see we we will try and avoid this kind of these kind of things. So as you can see, it's a separate piece uh, here. The eye is a separate whole separate piece and you want it to, con to be connected with the whole mesh and you don't want any holes in the mesh like this so because then uh, the slicer might think that this is an actually you know the object is gonna, going to be hollow inside and you will get lots of support and really ugly things happening and and it doesn't have to be such a small hole I mean it has I mean such a big hole it has can be a really tiny hole you won't even notice and sometimes, you know, the slicer can go crazy and it just takes longer to slice as well. And, you know, you're just gonna, you're gonna lose a lot of time. It's better to be safe than sorry and just uh, make your mesh manifold. So as you can see here, I've connected the edges and this, this one will be much easier, much better to print for our FDM printers even, as well as let's say you want to send it off to Shapeways that, uh, I don't know if everyone is familiar with Shapeways. Uh, this one was printed through Shapeways. It's a um, service they have those uh, powder printers, SLM and SLS printers, which, uh, which have a which very high resolution, but also if you have a non-manifold mesh, they might reject it or it might take longer for them to fix it and so on and so on. So you want your mesh to be beautiful so you can post it everywhere and sell it, your designs, you know, share it with people and uh, they won't have any problems printing it or um, it will be beautiful. Okay, so let me just get back to the presentation, see what's next, okay. Okay, so overhangs. So uh, I will actually jump in and back into the same file and uh, explain a bit about overhangs. So you, if you want, um, to have a really clean print, you would uh, you would try to design something that doesn't have any overhangs. And I'll show you in a second. For example, in this in case of Cezanne, it's really hard actually to get uh, something with no overhangs. But here, for example, if this part was flat, overhangs means that the angle here would be uh, bigger than uh, sorry smaller than 45 degrees. So if we go, actually, there's this really nice add-on called uh, 3D, print toolkit, 3D Printing uh, Toolbox. And um, you can check your file and see what's wrong with that file. So it has uh, overhang faces. So 
Yes, these ones here. You can still print it very easily, and your printer slicer will uh, generate some support, and, but it's never, never pretty. I, I try to avoid uh, support as much as I can because you, you will lose on some quality while printing uh, with support and also with adds time and slicing time and so on and so on. So this one you could, you could actually just cut it here and just print in a separate part, but the um, best uh, workflow is to just avoid too many overhangs. It's very hard with characters, if your character is standing, because there's no way you can print a human being with hands up without having overhangs, or here, here, everywhere. It's like we have, uh, we have really bad uh, anatomy. OK. So the, uh, the scale for, for designing Blender is pretty obvious. Um, one Blender unit is one millimeter in Repetier. So if you, if you scale your model properly, uh, you would uh, get these, so like one blender unit would be exactly one millimeter. So with that Suzanne, it would be uh, 13 centimeters, 13 and a half centimeters by 10 centimeters by roughly eight centimeters uh, big. And um, it's fine if you don't do it. I, I mean, you can always uh, scale it in, in the actual repetier itself. It will slice fine, you know. But if you want to be precise and if you want to share the, f uh, share the file with someone else, it's, uh, it's best to stick to those uh, guidelines because then they will, they will never know what kind of size, you know, scale is it in. And if they want to print the case and it's in the wrong scale, they will be like trying and they might get a wrong print. Like it's, it's, it gets a bit uh, nasty. And wall thickness. Uh, so that's uh, specifically important for printing, uh, actually, uh, for all of the types of printers, depending on what kind of wall thickness are we talking about. But if we're talking about the FDM printers, for example, we would, well, this, there's, there's no wall thickness here. If you look at Suzanne, it's just, just a huge uh, part of the, the brain is gone. Uh, <laughs> and th this has no thickness at all. And actually, I tried to slice it, and it sliced well like this. And what Slicer did, you would actually be surprised, but I actually managed to slice it, and it, actually, it was clever enough to think, OK, this model is in hollow. So you can see it, in, not in every case, but you, you would rather be careful, because it might just think that the whole, like I have a scan here. I, I was fixing of my face. Oh, no, not this way. Uh, so this is, this is a, this has no thickness at all, uh, at all either. This is just a bunch of planes connected together. So if you want to make sure that it uh, prints, you would probably orient it differently, print it with some support, add some thickness. But it's sliced. I mean, it's, it's sliced. It added some thickness, not much, like, <laughs> but it's, it looks really crazy. I mean, it wouldn't print. I mean, it's sliced, but I don't think it would print because the model is so thin here. It's only literally one couple millimeters, one, two millimeters thick, so it wouldn't print very well. You would uh, get some artifacts, and it would require a lot of cleanup as well and post-processing. You just want to avoid that. So there are, there are some design advices uh, right there, wall thickness. And uh, also for hollow models, I didn't actually mention it, but if you find Jonathan, he made a really nice tutorial about uh, Jonathan Williamson about uh, designing for shapeways. So for the powder um, printers, you would want uh, Suzanne. That's not a whole solid, because that would cost you, oh, hold on. I think I, I think actually, I'm not 100% sure, but uh, shapeways, shapeways uh, charges you, I think, per cubic centimeter of material used, because they reuse the powder. So you would basically uh, add some, uh, Wall thickness to the using solidify modifier or similar to the to your object and just leave a hole so they can just get the powder out. Otherwise, you just pay for the whole thing of for the whole. It calculates it's one one dense well, I mean one solid object. Um, so that's a good idea to keep in mind if you want to save some money. And, okay. 
Uh, so like I mentioned, the models, or, uh, the models orientation before. So this is something uh, important when you're printing on FDM printers, like in plastic. Then you wouldn't orient your model like this because it wouldn't, or like the hand, you wouldn't print it like this because it would just get a lot of uh, bad, you know, uh, here overhangs and a bunch of support. Just orient, always orient it like this, for example, that the less overhangs you get, the better. Uh, but on the powder printers, it doesn't matter. It can be in any kind of uh, orientation because it's still supported by the powder underneath it, so you're okay with it. Okay. Small thickness, small disorientation. Uh, topology, um, I've had some problems while designing some models. Uh, I designed this 3D hubs hard. Um, even though it's a very simple model with pretty clean topology, I, if I, I, I had to add this ledge around the, this object, otherwise it wouldn't slice for some reason. So you have to be careful sometimes about how you design something. If it doesn't slice, you have to have a look through, um, through your object, and if it's, you know, all, if it has a nice clean mesh and topology. Um, I wouldn't be too worried about and gons and, and quads. Usually we triangulate the mesh, but if, when you export it, does it anyway uh, to STL. But um, if you do it for someone else for our 3D printing, let's say for some uh, website that hosts models, then you would always try to avoid end guns because uh, you might some get some crazy triangulation there and just des desolate it to be totally different. You will not like it, the end result. Okay, so this one didn't slice. I had to fix it a bit, even though it's a, such a simple model. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. Let me go back to the presentation. So I've showed you the uh, 3D print toolkit before. It's a um, very nice uh, piece of of a uh, piece of add-on. It's a very nice add-on that you can use to actually show you what's wrong with your model. So I have some really bad model here with uh, some handguns <laughs> and some random like stuff going on and uh, a hole so it's not manifold. And if you use a 3D print toolkit to see what's happening here, you will get some overhangs. That, yeah, so it's non-manifold right here. You want to close it. Uh, it's, there are non-flat faces, so that ca that might not be very good if you give the model to someone else. If they use some funky slicer, you know, you never use some proprietary stuff. Uh, overhang faces, so, well, the bottom, you don't have to worry about it. It sits on the platform anyway. Um, but it's sliced. In sli I mean, in slicer, it's sliced fine. So there wasn't any problem with that, even though it was so bad. The slicer was clever enough to actually, to actually slice it. So I would be careful, though, still, because different slicers, different methods, especially if you do it for someone else. For myself, I, I still, I still keep my meshes really clean, and I just try to avoid all them. All the problems to just to be professional, you know, you have to have good habits. After all, if you if you don't do something, then yeah, and you have to be uh, sure that not only the mesh is manifold, but all the normals are facing the right direction. So in this in this case, you can see all the normals are facing up outwards as it's supposed to be. But also, I added this disk inside to. Uh, put the magnet in while it's printing, for example, in this case. And if the um, normals are facing the direction, it won't slice properly. In this case, it's sliced, uh, and you could you would be able to put a magnet inside. I have some 3 printed here. So there are magnets inside these, uh, actually, this inside these prints. So if you want to do something like this. Mm, okay. 3D print toolkit. Yes, I insert the magnet while it's printing. So uh, 
a certain layer, you have to watch watch the and make sure in your design that the dimensions are right. For the just you have to measure the magnets width and and diameter. And what? Uh, well, I didn't stop it. I just, just put it in there <laughs> while it's printing. So uh, on a bigger object, especially like this, it's it's easy because it's so easier to get there while the extruder is on the other side. <laughs> but uh, with smaller magnets, when I was trying to do it with uh, I like a very tiny disc. Then, then I had to stop it and just move the extruder away because otherwise I would put my finger on the extruder. It was like 240 degrees. I don't didn't want to risk that. I get burned a couple of times, so it's it's very risky business. No. Uh, well, the, the the nozzle I'm using is uh, is aluminum. I presume it didn't it didn't interfere. So, but I mean, so it didn't, the magnet didn't move. Although the, the screws in my in the cooler in my printer are metal, and uh, and they attract actually they actually attract the magnet. So I had to use a, a piece of blue tack on the magnet just 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 to make sure to, to, because uh, otherwise it would like wobble around while it was uh, printing around it. It wasn't a problem though; it was just a precaution. It's uh, I mean you have to know what kind of device you're using again because. Uh, you might just jump out, and uh, no. <laughs> okay, so uh, for topologizing, so it's another uh, area that m many people are especially late, lately interested in. Uh, when you scan someone, you would get a really, really, really dense mesh. So in this case, uh, when I had this scanned, it's like 184,000 vertices. Well, you want to be below 500,000, but then again, if you you can see, uh, I mean, it's all orange. If you um, if you reduce the amount of vertices, so if you decimate the mesh, it will reduce the slicing times. And uh, I always always decimate the mesh no matter what, just to reduce the slicing times because I don't want to wait there for 20 minutes. And um, you won't see any difference anyway. I think I I could. Uh, decimated like 80 percent, 70 percent of it, and it would still look the same. And you have to keep in mind that the printers don't have that great resolution, especially plastic. It's, it will look completely fine afterwards anyway, because when it prints, you just you know you're gonna get a bunch of that stuff. Okay, so then smash. Longer slicing times. Uh, this one, this one, I think. Yeah, this one was. Sliced, and this is actually a really dense mesh. So it took took a couple minutes. No, oh no, you know, this is the decimated one. But if it wasn't decimated, it would take like three times longer than than normally did. So this one, I think, it took like a couple minutes. And uh, and actually, the repeater is really quick. For I mean, slicer is really quick for me about slicing. So if you use MakerBot or something like that, then uh, or Cura, I don't know about Cura guys, but. Uh, that might take uh, longer or shorter, so it's it's just better to you know know that if you have a machine that has this kind of resolution, then there's no point in having such a dense mesh because it will just waste your time slicing. And so another impo very important thing: so scans are non-manifold, so you get this uh, you know this is like a paper sheet basically, like it's all flat. There's no no solid pieces here. You could like stick it to some generic model of a face, human face or something, and uh, just connect it somehow or re uh, reproduce that other scan. If you don't, if you have a parts of scan missing, especially if you scan a person, there is very often a hole at the top of their head or something, and you have to, you have to fix that, close that gap. Otherwise, you will have a non-manifold mesh again, and uh, might have some weird stuff happening with that while slicing. Uh, okay. So retopologize. Re decimate. Remember, decimate remesh is very is very useful. Doing that uh, remesh modifier and decimate modifier. Okay. And uh, I think I had. So how much time do I have left? Because I think uh, I think I'm almost. I don't know. I think I'm, I'm, I have some stuff, but okay. So I'll just I'll add some some more things. So, you, so for example, when you design a case, this is actually oriented so the uh, 
sorry, Z app. But um, if you design for someone, if you design especially for Thingiverse or uh, something like Shapeways, they use a more common way of Y app. And if you if you upload your STL that's just exported from Blender, it will be rotated around the X axis. It won't uh, it won't be uh, facing the user, so it doesn't present very well. They can still rotate it. I, I think in the software you can rotate it, or when you upload it to some of the websites. But it's better to just uh, rotate your object around 90 degrees around the x-axis, so you get it uh, facing like this in the front view. Uh, I think the other way around. No. You have to. You have to. Uh, it's a hit and miss with those services. But. Um, Another thing, uh, while you design, let's say, for example, phone cases or objects like this, you always want to print it like this, design it so it's printed flat, the flattest surface touching the ground. But you have to make sure there are some, oh, there is a hole you would need to use some support. So that also might, might be a problem when you, if you want to print it on home printer. There are some very thin places here, thin Thin, very thin uh, gap, uh, wall, walls, and uh, the thickness of that will actually, I don't think it would print on a FDM printer very well. You only can go as far as twice the width of your nozzle, so in most cases about 0.8 millimeter, this thickness here. If it's any thinner than that, sometimes the slicer must ju might just ignore it because there's nothing there or it's just too thin and it will be one line it is you are stretching basically the the printer printer's capabilities in this case if you go very thin you won't get the same resolution will look ugly in very in many many cases and with many different materials it's just uh I'll probably invert it make it actually solid here with just those cutouts and that would be would be prettier in such a case and I saw some people printing the cases uh like this so not not actually not laying down horizontally on the bed, just vertically weird because it can re easily unstick from the printing bed, from the heated bed, but I've seen some really, like some very well uh, printed cases like that, uh, oriented like this on the on the printer, and that depends on the, what kind of design you have again. Depends where, you, where do you need the most of the resolution to be. In the z-axis, you get the most most of the resolution. So, like this, you can get 0.1. With most of the printers, you you go 0.1. With SFDM printers, 0.1 millimeter. That is, but it's very 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 uh, tiny. Okay, so if I go to my screen, uh, yeah. But if you don't have a printer, uh, there are um, Many people, prima. Netherlands is number one, I think one of the number one places for 3D printing. And wherever you go, any bigger city, you're going to have some hacker space, fab lab around, where are people that have a 3D printer. And 3D hubs, they, they have uh, a very, very big community of uh, 3D printer owners. So you can always find some really cool people around you. And uh, you can always have your designs tested first on an actual 3D printer. And very many people would just do it for for pennies, for a couple cents. And, uh, I always meet some nice people on those meetups. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions? If yes, should I put, do we have the working microphone? Um, I don't know if I missed anything. Maybe I missed something. I'll just Hello. Have a uh, in the three D printing toolbox. You have a uh, on the end panel a uh, mesh analysis button. No, on the end panel, the on, oh yeah, on the end panel. There yeah. you have mesh analysis normally. Do I have to go to edit mode? Yeah. Yeah. Where is mesh analysis? Fill uh, down. Yeah. 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 And then you can have yeah, yeah. Uh, colorized. Yeah. So so it so it gives you the the angle. Yeah, yeah colors where you have uh, where you have the problems, so yeah. it's easier to fix. That's if you are yeah if you are actually editing the mesh, you would use that. Yeah. And uh, as soon as you start editing, you the you you will see the color uh, mm -hmm. fade yeah, it will, to that uh, it to will that change. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah. 
That's really cool if you want to start modeling and yeah, true, true. see overhangs. I've seen it. Directly. I've seen it being used, but I actually myself, I, I uh, always, I already see the overhangs everywhere <laughs> in my life. So <laughs> there no so there's no support here. I'm really worried about this. Yeah. Um. Uh, how are you going to um, post-process the models afterwards? So do you have a specific sanding so, or? Um, Post process uh, when it's after it's printed, yeah. or yeah, after it's printed, like it's sometimes if the Z resolution isn't high enough, you get like these little stairs. Yes, um, yes. So that depends on the material you use. With the uh, FDM, with plastic, if let's say if you print in ABS, I think this is ABS here. So this is uh, you print on higher temperature, but this uh, you can actually. Uh, they look the same. I mean, I don't even know why I'm showing you. They, they, you cannot tell apart very easy, so easily un unless you burn it. It smells. Um, you can basically you can. I wouldn't try it at home. It's it's really risky uh, with this kind of material. You you would uh, give it a bath of hot alcohol, like, like acetone vapor. Or something like this. Yeah, acetone vapor. Right. So, but acetone is uh, toxic. So you do it outdoors with a covered. Yeah. Environment okay. and it's flammable, so it can explode. I wouldn't. <laughs> you can, you can also. Well, you can always sand it. You can always sand it. Yes. Can I? I didn't hear your question. Yeah, I've done a, a number of tests with it. I've done a number of tests with it because I was curious because you read about yeah. it, you see it on the internet. I've read a lot about it as well. well yeah. I mean, I'm still alive, and the house did not get on fire. No, no, no. You have and to be it really careful. Really, really smooth. If it's a very well ventilated place, and you and you are not a smoker. Then, and if you don't don't would like to stick your head with smoking a cigarette into the actual box with the, with the acetone vapor and oxygen, then I think you will be fine. Okay, so but I still don't breathe that. I mean, there, there's there's I've heard like stories it can burn, explode. But same, don't do it in your room because it's not not very not very ventilated. Hello. You have lots of electronics around. It might just spark and you're gone. Well, um, sorry. Your hair. This is this is so on. Yeah. Um, and for PLA, you can use uh, like um, acrylic primer. It's like gray paint, and you put it on and then sand it off so you don't yes. lose any detail. It's so, like, so yeah, uh, I would, I would coat it. Really, um, it's like the typical stuff you would do with uh, molded uh, materials uh, too. So you got really true, true, true. detail. There is, there is also there is some different kind of alcohol I, I've heard uh, they use for um, polishing PLA, but I uh, the name was really. It's a lot, really long, some chemical name, and it's not very popular. And it was quite, quite, I think, uh, quite toxic, uh, more, more toxic than that than acetone. Um, also, you can always sand it, like you said, paint it with something, take sand it. You can um, uh, temperature, like you can, if you burn it, let's say you have small torch. Depending on the plastics, on PLA is not all the same. It has different additives to different PLAs, and sometimes they will change color. Now, sometimes they will just get shiny. I, I've burned some PLA and, and it had a nice finish before. So you can you can do that, yeah. There's some many things you can try. Yeah. Yes. Excuse me, you, you've talked about FDM, um, but what are the relative resolutions that the three technologies will give me? Uh, so re relatively to SLA to well, the SLS sorry, SLM printers? FDM gave you I think it was point one millimeter in the, the z-axis. Well, you can go things? lower. I mean, you can go lower. Uh, I've heard of 0 0.05 and 3. Like, it goes goes below that. But then with FDM. With FDM, there there are there were some printers, but I don't think I haven't seen many people printing at less than 0 0.1 or like 0 0.05. If you print that at 0 0.1, I think this one was printed 0. Point, I think 15 or 0. Yeah, something like that. It took like five hours, four hours. If you go uh, at 0 0.05, so that's like less than a one tenth of a half, half of a one tenth of a millimeter. So you you increase the printing time by twice and prints for eight hours, and it's just not not really. You don't want to wait for that. You can't see the difference between those resolutions than in the z-axis because uh, uh, between the small, you know, I mean, you just simply cannot see that that difference in resolution. You will still see the layers, but what about the other technologies? They in, get finer, um, much finer. So the uh, SLA printers 
are kind of in the middle ground. You have you use a resin, and again you cure it with a laser or or light UV light. I think they most of them use it, and uh, their resolutions are much much lower. So you can see like very small uh, printed parts, like tiny figures with hands and everything. Twenty-five and millimeter figures is exactly what I'm thinking of. What is it? The, 25 the, the gesture you just made with your hand suggests you're thinking about what I call a 25 millimeter figure, which are the ones you use for tabletop wargaming. Uh, That's what I'm after. <laughs> yes, although they they, uh, they use a clear resin, so most of the time you get like a choice of couple colors, and uh, it's always uh, pretty clear, like they're clear. I would rather use something like uh, like on an SLM or SLA printer, and um, then you you can print in very fine resolutions as well. You can do those, you can do those small small figures. You get them. The best resolution you get with the, is with SLA and uh, SL, SLM SLS printers, but they're really expensive. <coughs> That's with uh, with yes 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 like like I said so so it doesn't matter how you orient your model uh, depending on what printer do you print for for example with this case you can orient it in any way and on SLA uh, I mean SLS and SLM printers in powder it won't matter because there is powder underneath it so you don't need to care about overhangs and you don't need to care as much about the wall thickness and um, yeah, other, what other things? Uh, yeah, it's stronger as well. The plastic is is pretty stronger. Yes. Uh, not working, but uh, when you print. In I'll repeat the question. Don't worry. When you print in PLA, uh, know that PLA uh, absorbs 20, 10 to fifteen percent of humidity. So, uh, so yes, you have to be careful in, with PLA. You have uh, to store your PLA yes, 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 yes. I would, I would, uh, I would suggest to store it uh, in a container that, that you can uh, in vacuum container perfectly when there's no oxygen. Uh, but stuff like dust and humidity in the air can damage it. Or you, you can use rice. Rice can also Yeah, true. Uh, PLA you can. I haven't so, tried that. So you, you will not break but, the models uh, after you've done printing. Because sometimes if you don't do that, uh, if, you, if you just done printing and you don't do that, it will, it will easily break. And if you put it in water mm. 50 degrees afterwards, it's not that good. If you print with support. <laughs> so you have to be careful because you might damage the model. So it depends how you design it, especially yeah, the very small parts. <laughs> but but I understand, I understand the, your point. Yeah, I, I've heard stories that that it's just it, it loses its uh, quality over time. I uh, myself with the PLA I, I've used it's been sitting uh, in my room for a year. Some of the some of the uh, spools I have, and they are still fine, printing very well. But um, I I tend to put them in plastic bags, and so there is they don't absorb uh, any more humidity than they already absorb now. So. You can, you, that's that's very yeah. You have to you have to know the material using, but that's, you, we are getting very technical now, and most of the people won't really you know, <coughs> care about that. I've, but if you have a, like a lot of material and that's a lot of money, then you have to be careful. Yes, I think there's a question. Do you have a question here? Oh, first here. Yes. Yeah, one question: Are the objects printed with PLA or ABS food safe? For example, I print uh, base well, food, PLA itself is uh, cornstarch derived, so cornstarch is well, corn. You know, it's food safe itself. But they, there are additives to those plastics always, coloring agents and other additives to make them stronger and not as brittle. And um, that's the stuff you have to worry about. They usually tell you, oh, the material is uh, there are no known toxins, but we wouldn't advise it to use it with food stuff. I think there are some specific different different plastics. Like for example, ABS doesn't doesn't uh, interact as well. So ABS, some of the ABS ones might be food safe. 
and Colorfab, the Dutch company, has uh, some new filament that's food safe ish, I think. <laughs> but um, I, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try. Even if, even if it's food safe, you still get, you still get, might get some lead from your extruder, from your printer in there. So, yeah, that's another thing you didn't consider. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but. But um, generally, I mean, I've, I've had beer from this one, and I'm still alive, so <laughs> twice. <laughs> so. <laughs> so it may be that maybe the, the heat index to the bacteria uh, Well, it probably kills them all. It's at 200 degrees, so. Uh, but um, no, there's this uh, plastic that, you know, like, like our friend there said, you know, the, the plastic is, that absorbs lots of water, and we have so many crevices here and and small spaces that you know there are lots of probably plenty of bacteria in there that you cannot see and you cannot just wash it very well so that's another thing I would be concerned about you know not very good for maybe for prototyping but uh, I would uh, eventually I would print like in ceramics or something you know there are some different printers you know. okay, in shapeways, I think they print yeah you can you in can, ceramics yes shapeways can print in ceramics or you can you can post process some models yourself and make them smooth and paint them with some would say paint or something, if there's something like that exists. Okay, thank you. Yes, you have a question? I was wondering if you had any experience printing molds or printing negatives? And no, then... but I know you can do it <laughs> in wax. I haven't, I haven't actually, well, not for, depends what kind of molds. Um, not for, uh, if you want to, what do, you, what do you want to mold? What kind of, you want to mold, you make a mold. Well, start with something easy like latex or rubber. Um, I don't think that, uh, like, what depends on material would you use, but if it has a, lowing, a lower uh, uh, melting temperature than, than PLA, much lower, then it should be fine in, in you know, in plastic, with plastic molds. But I use I used PLA to print uh, molds for soaps. So you use, um, like, they, you can just pour that in there and the plastic won't melt or won't even change it, change the hardness and and the, the soap you put that you put that in the fridge, then it solidifies. You have soap with your own design on it, something like that. So, but um, so yes, yeah, so it depends what you want to mold, really. And uh, I've heard that you know first you print, yeah, the molds in one thing, then you make a wax, you know, cast, and then you go around. That's how they do in shapeways. I think that the metal printing is actually casting from from wax, something. making that wax. Yes. Is Matthew? Just to answer your question, the uh, jewelry people they use it a lot yeah. uh, because they they three D print in uh, uh, either they cast latex molds if they do just want to make after uh, they use the mold for wax and then or they can have a castable resin uh, that you can cook and then they put it in um, gypsum uh, plat. I don't know how you call it. Exactly. Gypsum. And because, gypsum. The, uh, because the, as far as I know, the SLM as uh, SLS printers they don't print metal. Metal. They they have some composites. It's like a powder with so we have a, a powdered metal with some uh, agent that you know binding agent and then it you use a laser on it and kind of binds it. But and if you polish it, it might look like metal, but it's not quite metal. So if you want to cast like jewelry or you want to have a solid golden statue, then you'd have to make them mold for that first, print a mold and then but the, yeah. the, like uh, wax. There are some waxes, printable yeah. waxes that work well but for FDM when you burn it, a PLA you can burn it in the in the uh, oven but there are some residues so you lose some, uh, some resolution because you never manage to burn it completely. You have to burn it then you have to whoosh, whoosh, with hair in it but there are still some dirt there are rubber printers, so you can print directly into rubber, you don't need to. There yeah. are rubber printers, you can print 3D print rubber, and you can also, for example, 3D print sand, and sand can also be used as a mold. Good point. You have so many printers coming out that you cannot, can't keep up. Print, people are printing chocolate and <laughs> sugar. Sugar, sugar, chocolate, yeah. I've seen I've seen a lot of weird stuff. So people are bringing dough, making cookies, and then you just put it in the oven, reprint a cookie. 
livers, there was a three printed liver, burger for four hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> you want. So what about colored three D printing with desktop printers? When will it be possible? Uh, I've heard some developments but they are still not not options that we have, that is what's being developed. So I I've, I've saw people that actually use three different colors or four different colors. Um, but I don't know how it well did it work out. You know what I mean, As in, you, it mixes a sample of different colors depending what color do you want. So it would print you a full color figure, for example. But there are some, mostly it is uh, so the, the nicer ones I saw, the SLM ones, they would they would paint the powder itself first, then then actually, um, you know, sinter it or melt it. Uh, but these printers are very very expensive because there are patents on them. But as the patents are expiring now, I've heard even of um, one SLM machine SLS machine being developed that might in a couple of years bring us a uh, very very high-end printers like this, powder printers, and very possibly full-color printers to prices of a couple thousand pounds, dollar, uh, euros, that it would be viable then, but not yet. It, right now, it's in tens of thousands, if not more, uh, euros, these machines. And uh, it does be all, all, of, all because of the patents. There are no companies, there's no competition, so they just price it very highly. And also, you, you have a laser that you know, can kill you if you... If you you need a laser physicist to develop a printer like that now. Otherwise, you know, this is very dangerous, I heard. So you don't try it. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Uh, yeah, Sorry, wait. Just got one quick question. That's, uh, you say one blender u unit is one millimeter in uh, uh, Program you're using. So, if, if you, okay, so that might depend on the software you're using, but for example, one, one blender unit uh, equals to one uh, millimeter. Yeah, if I export it? an STL without scaling it in uh, STL, you, you know we have this dialogue when you export uh -huh. to STL, whether it wants you to scale it, and uh, if you don't, we just leave the, um, the value at one, then it will be one millimeter in Repetier. And as far as I remember, in Shapeways as well, it would be one, one blender into one. But um, I was just curious because um, in theory we've got uh, units in Blender. We I know, and it's weird because one, one blender unit should be one meter. Yeah, but or, it, um, you would think one millimeter in Blender units would yes. be one millimeter in S, S, no. STL, but it's no. not. No, it's not. It's, uh, I mean... It's it's uh, it's a bit different. I, that's the first thing I I found out. I was really really surprised and really like really worried. Like why why isn't it this way? Uh, so you just keep using Blender units I, and then I use I use one unit as a um, as a one millimeter now. I don't I don't even switch two centimeters anymore in the sink. I don't use, yeah I don't just, uh, change that to metric because if you change if you change to metrics it. You could that. You could do that. Yes. You correct. It. Yes, but it's not logical. So you see that this is a very big phone case. If you printed that, you could you could you could put a phone case on your on your house. No. No more questions. Okay. Thank you very much. If you have any more questions, uh, my website is not working at the moment because my do other domain it was pointing at is expired. But uh, if you have any questions, I'll be around for like three next three days still. So uh, you can always ask me anything.